Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to another All Things Avenia. My name is Eli Travers. Uh, we're here. We're starting May, which actually is going to be the last month of scheduled All Things Avenia episodes. We'll take a little break during the summer. Uh, we might come back with a few things here and there throughout the summer, but maybe coming back in the fall as well. Um, so you get a chance to enjoy the sun, travel if you can, if you're vaccinated and you can get out there and really enjoy what's out there. Um, but I'm super, super excited for the first interview in May to be with a really talented winemaker, all around awesome professional, Erica Or Erica, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored. Yes. No, we're very honored. We, you know, we've worked with Erica through different ways for a while. I've known you about your wines for a long time and have sold them and enjoyed them. Um, so it's fun to, to get a chance to talk to you, maybe get into some of your background and sort of what what things drive you, but also get into like the nitpicky details about your, your lab and some of the cool things you're doing um, in here in Washington. But uh, to start off, you know, I, in part of my preparation is, is stalking you on online and, and looking at your website and maybe some of the interviews you've done. But I love on your website in your about section how um, apparently you had you met Aaron Potts, a, a great winemaker from Napa in San Francisco, and he's the, sort of the one who convinced you that winemaking was a cool job uh, and sort of got you out of the lab sort of science chemist realm and into winemaking. And I was hoping you could just talk a little bit about that moment, but also what you were doing, what your background was up into that point. Yeah. Uh, well, I was 25 years old living in San Francisco. So I had studied, my undergrad is in biochemistry. Um, so I was interested in science and uh, I knew I liked science. I was good at science, um, but I also loved going to restaurants and going to Napa and Sonoma on the weekends with my friends. Um, so uh, my friend Angela and I were out at this, it's a bar that's also a music venue called Cafe du Nord in San Francisco. And we sat down at the bar and Aaron sat next to me. And I remember Angelo like thought he was cute and was trying to, they, they were basically chatting with me in the middle of the two of them. And he was describing like he, he worked at Behringer at that time and had worked in Bordeaux and he'd worked in South America. And it just sounded like I mean, the, the encounter was not that long. I mean, it's not like, um, you know, we spent hours and I was like taking notes on what he was saying, but my, my brief experience was that he traveled the world. He spoke a whole bunch of languages um, and he went through the program at Davis so mm -hmm. that there was formal training in enology, which is the study of wine separate from viticulture, which is the grape growing um, mm -hmm. biology study. So uh, yeah, Aaron told me to, before applying to school, work at a winery and like, see what it's like, you know, find out if I like it or not. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was the piece that was like so invaluable because um, some of my classmates, I mean, I knew people who just, you know, it sounded like a cool program and they applied and they got in, but I feel like it was helpful having a, a little bit of experience from the winery that then I could bring to the classroom for our different winemaking technology and you know how the pump works and what's happening inside of the press. Like right. to have worked at a winery first was helpful. Right, right. That's that's crazy. That's so funny too. Like so when you you did go to Davis, so you you ended up. Um, going to UC Davis, which is a, a renowned program for wine, for all things wine. Um, but was it a specific focus? Like is it at UC, and I don't really know this, is there like, you like you said, analogy of viticulture, is there like a, a lab like portion of it or is, are there specific majors or different focuses that you had at UC Davis? Yeah, and I think it's different now. I mean, it was a long time ago when I was at school. Um, when I was there, I, so technically my degree is in food science. Hmm. So it's like food science subheading enology. Um, so we had to take some food science courses. And then the professor that I ended up doing my master's thesis with um, was doing 
microbiology. So this was in line with my training. You know, I didn't need a ton of training to come into his lab. Mm -hmm. So, but so I guess my classmates, I mean, they've studied all kinds of different things. Um, There's sensory science, Mm -hmm. um, more more chemistry, more um, analytical chemistry as opposed to microbiology. Right, right. Wow. Well, so in, was it while you were doing your master's, is this when you had a chance to work with like Kathy Corison and other places in Napa? Or, and then you also worked um, in other places all over the world. You went to, to Dujac in Burgundy and you were in Yering Station in, in Australia. Was that during your master's, like it's certain programs or certain harvests? Or how did you start traveling and, and working with other wineries? Right. And I think uh, the program is different now, but back mm-hmm. then we were allowed to take the fall quarter off to work harvest. So uh, I worked for Kathy Corson. and that was the harvest that Aaron Potts suggested I work before going to school. So Kathy was like my first ever harvest, my first exposure to any winery. And that oh, was in 1998. You, uh, the jackpot there. With the Seriously, <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, so she is a pioneer in California winemaking uh, and really has had this classic consistent style of Cabernet Sauvignon that for better or for worse has not varied through the years. I feel like she's, um, she's the name that pops up the most often when people talk about, you know, uh, Robert Parker, the Parkerization of, of wines and how a lot of producers started making really ripe, extracted, oaky, big wines to please the scoring public. And Kathy just kept doing her thing. And those wines have just aged beautifully. And now that the trend is going back towards her style of winemaking. And I right. love that she's just always been like, just so consistent. Yeah. Totally. Amazing. Yeah. So, so that's cool. So yeah. So, so tell me a little more about um, when you did get to travel, especially, was this your first time traveling to France or to Australia? Or had you been able to travel before and, and, uh, and do that? A, a tiny bit. So when I... When I finished college, a friend of mine was living in London and I was able to stay in her apartment. And I, I feel that was a long trip. I mean, this was like a three week long trip. Mm. Um, this was, Eli, I don't know if you were there. I don't think you were. We, so I, my, I graduated from college. I wanted to travel and my parents were like, that's great. But like we're not giving you money for this like <laughs> you need your own money so I tried to get on Jeopardy I tried I tried to win Jeopardy to fund this European adventure I didn't get on the show but um I was able to <laughs> through like kind of couch surfing and a cheap ticket from San Francisco to London um so I, my first trip was around England I went to Ireland mm-hmm. I went to Wales I was in the UK, British Isles. Yeah. Uh, And then I had visited Paris with my friend Angela, the girl that we, Mm -hmm. I was with, with Aaron Pot. Um, But then in 2002, that's when I worked the harvest at Domaine du Jac. So I lived in Paris for a month in the summer of that year, and then did a little road trip. Um, through the Rhone Valley with one of my classmates from school who was in France at the same time and uh, it was fun it so we and uh, like I I was able to taste wines that looking back now like were totally amazing and are super expensive and rare Um, so I was in the right place at the right time I guess to taste some amazing Chateau Neuf du Pop and um, awesome Burgundy of course Wow. Yeah, totally. And so then, so, so France, so now you've had experience with old world winemaking and, and, and old worlds, I guess, you know, meaning European uh, styles of wine, but then you also got a chance to go to Australia. And I feel like that's, those are very different um, experiences. Although, yeah. like, you know, the, the winery you're working at is one of the oldest wineries in Victoria. It's been around for a long time. It's in Yarra Valley which does some of the more, I guess, Burgundian style wines of the region. Yes, you know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, yes. Well, you know, a little bit of, little bit of research. No. <laughs> um, but I, so what was that like? Is, is now all of a sudden being thrown into a totally different um, uh, place, you know, Southern Hemisphere, 
Um, and was this after, because you said that you could always, you could leave your master's program in the fall to do harvest, but their harvest is in the spring or, or like winter, spring for us. So when, when was it that you got to Australia and what was that? Yeah. Like? So we skipped over a couple other harvests. I worked in California for two harvests. So 2000, I was at Cane Vineyard on Spring Mountain in Napa Valley. In yeah. 2001, I went to Gary Farrell in the Russian River Valley. Oh, yeah. So oh, Gary Farrell. Oh, two, I went to Burgundy. And then I, so I moved, how did this work? I remember coming back. I lived with my mom and dad for that, like, holiday, New Year's. And then 2003, the beginning of 2003, I submitted my thesis. Mm. But it was not yet signed, I don't think, when I left for Melbourne. Right. So I, that, like, I technically graduated while I was in Australia. Cool. Wow. And that's, and so, and were you making Pinot? Like what, like what wines were you making down there? Yeah. So uh, this was a, another Davis connection. So my connection to Dujac is a classmate of mine from Davis. And the connection to Yering Station uh, is Darren Rathbone, who um, was one of my classmates. There are only 12 of us in, in the program. So like we became close friends. And so he invited me down to work um, in the cellar and they, it's a big facility. So they had, there's a fancy restaurant on the grounds there. We, the interns lived in housing that was on the property. There's a cafe. Um, so they made sparkling wine, Pinot and Chardonnay, but they also did like cool climate Shiraz, mm -hmm. Cabernet Sauvignon. It seemed like there was a lot of different varietals. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So, I mean, that's, that's a lot of experience and a lot of things to draw on before you even get to Washington. And I feel like, you know, one of the reasons we're here and, and why I'm talking to you is because you've made such a presence here in Washington. So you, you got to Washington in 2003 or five or 2005. Um, and you, what was, what were some of the first things you were doing up here? Cause I know that for a while you were consulting, like before you started making wine full time with your own label, which we'll get to and we'll taste some awesome wines in a minute. But, um, what brought you to Washington and like, what was your first experience like working in, in Woodenville and like in this, this part of the country and in industry? Yeah. Uh, well, I came up here for my ex-husband. Uh, so he took a job in Seattle. Um, so when I was in Napa, he lived in San Francisco. He took a job in Seattle. We did a long distance thing for a year. And then I, I moved up in 2005 and I was assistant winemaker at Matthews mm -hmm. uh, for one year. And I met a lot of people. I mean, it's a small community. I don't have to tell you. And uh, so I was able to meet Mark Ryan. I was able to meet Chris Sparkman. I was able to meet Jerry Reiner from Guardian. Mm -hmm. um, so these people ended up shaping my life later on. But uh, at the time, they were just friends of the owner of Matthews and hanging around. Right. And is this when you were also um, doing lab stuff or, or like in, in part of your consulting and, and working with these wineries, were you, were you still bringing your sort of chemistry background and your, and, and that lab background to analyze wines and, and help people out in that way? I did. So Matt had a lab at Matthews. Um, mm -hmm. So I was doing analysis for him and he's, he's a consultant. So I did the lab analysis for his consulting clients. Um, and then when I left Matthews, it was Mark Ryan and Jerry who suggested that I start my own thing. Right. Like before this, I was not like entrepreneurial minded, <laughs> right. but um, they convinced me that it could work. Like there was a need for independent wine analysis in Woodenville and I, I am able to offer same day results. So a lot of winemaking decisions, you know, are fast paced and you need the data yesterday. Right. So, right. so I had this sort of niche market where there was a population of wineries and they needed lab work. So, uh, so yeah, I started doing consulting for Mark and 
Sparkman in 2006. Yeah. And so, and so you did that for a while. When, so I want to get into your first wine here because, because I'm a little thirsty and I think we it's, it's nice <laughs> drink some wines here. Um, but you ended up getting to the point where you were working for, um, you were consulting and then you were brought on at Bear Winery, right? And, and when, when was that? Uh, what year was 2007. That? Seven. So then you, that, that became sort of, I guess, was that more of your focus is making wines over at Bear and, and developing? Yeah. Them? I mean, my, my client list has changed a little bit over the years, but uh, yeah, Bear has been a focus since 07. Yeah. Well, I know it's funny because that, that's where I first heard about you. And I think a lot of people in the industry, when we, when we were selling, uh, wines. I remember le at Purple learning about you through Bear, like through the Ursa and, and some of these wines in Arctis and that we had on the list, um, which was really fun. And then you got to finally launch your own label. Um, and this is where, I, cause just because I want to start drinking, we have um, Erica's Chenin Blanc here. This is the, the Or uh, 2020 Chenin Blanc. Is it just Or Winery or Vineyards or is it just? Yeah, Or Wines. Yeah. Or wines. Oh yeah, or wines. Um, and this is what's, it's funny because when, if I were to say your name to people like Psalms in the industry and people in the know, the first thing they'll say like, oh yeah, she makes Shannon. And and it's such a, it's such a cool thing. And Shannon Blanc, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's a huge, it's a, a very prominent and popular wine in the Loire Valley uh, in France, but also in South Africa. I mean, in, in, in different places in the world, but Washington actually has some history and is in, and I love that this is something that you latched onto. What was it that, that drove you to be like, you know what, I'm going to start my winery and this is what I want to focus on. Yeah. Uh, well, the personal story is that I was going through a divorce and, uh, Jerry from guardian, um, generously um, offered to help me start my own brand. Hmm. So this was a huge deal. And so I, I was very like pragmatic about it. Like I didn't want to directly compete with my consulting clients. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do something different from what those guys were doing. And I was, I was interested in old vines. So like, I think, old vine Zinfandel in California is something special and rare. And I wanted to do something that's sort of like, I don't know, paid homage to Washington's viticultural heritage. Mm -hmm. So the first vineyard that I worked with um, was planted in 1974, which is oh. also my birth year. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, like these are old vines and not that you're seemed, old by any means, but no, the vines I, for I, vines I, age, I guess that would be old. Thank you. Young but, human old vines. I think we have to <laughs> Yeah. So I, I just thought that was a cool story, you know? And like so I, I have this idea of working with old vines and then um Lynn Scott, my buddy from Sparkman Cellars, and Dick Boucher, the viticulturalist, and I met in the vineyard um, in Prosser and walked the rows, and it really seemed cool. And then Dick told me about some wine that was made off of this fruit, right? So like I, I'm into analysis. <laughs> I want to know the chemistry. So um, it was a winery in Oregon called Merriman. Huh. So they were they were buying this um, Yakima Valley Shenan for their brand. So I bought some of that wine and I really liked it. I liked that it was minerally and not overtly tropical fruity. Mm -hmm. it, it was subtle. And I, I wanted to make a wine that would go onto a oyster bar wine list. Yeah. yeah. Because I love oysters. And <laughs> <laughs> so th this seemed to fit the bill. Like it, it's sort of an underdog variety. The playing field at that time was more open than it is now. Right. And it was something different than what my clients were doing. Uh, and it's not super expensive. Like I, I wouldn't require a whole bunch of new French oak barrels and mm -hmm. two years aging and three years and like, it was something that I could kind of turn around quickly. Right. Um, yeah. Well, and you, you, were, you said you had some pictures of, of maybe some of the vineyards or some of the things. I was wondering if you were able to share your screen and maybe 
Yes. Show us some of these, some of the places where you get this, this Shannon Blanc. Okay. I love pictures. <laughs> All right. All right. So here's, here's some of the people I was talking about. The guy in the middle is Jerry from Guardian. Mm -hmm. That's my mom and dad. All oh, right. So here, um, this is the vineyard I'm talking about. This is Rothrock Vineyard. Hmm. You can see these vines are, the trunk is huge. Like they're really gnarly. Yeah. Yeah. And quite vigorous. Like uh, there's a lot of green shoot growth here. Mm -hmm. um, so this is at Pick. This is a different site called Upland on Snipes Mountain. Mm -hmm. And so this is just like how tiny my production is. Um, so I, I ferment in a mixture of large format oak. Uh, hogsheads, which are 79 gallon barrels. Mm -hmm. I also use some normal size barrels, which are 59 gallon oak barrels. They're all used oak, but they are still like a, I don't know. They are interacting with air. Yeah. And, yeah. Right. A non inert container. But I also use inert containers like these stainless steel drums that you can see. So this is, a, this is another picture from Rothrock. Um, just that showing a these huge vine, like a very old gnarly vine that you don't see a lot of in Washington. Right. That's crazy. Yeah, I really thought it seemed like unique. You know, here's another glamour shot of Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> this is this is Upland Vineyard. Um, so here, you can see that there's two fruiting zones. So back in the yeah. '70s they were really trying to increase the yield. The Chenin hmm. Blanc is naturally quite high yielding. They want to push it even more to use as a blender, um, I think in Riesling and Chardonnay blends. Hmm. Uh, and then they just never changed the trellising. So, um, so is for me- Well, I guess today, cause like the older the vine gets, the lower yields you get off of it. So does that actually help balance out the naturally lowering of yields as the vine ages because you have more fruit zones and more fruit or maybe there was like so many sort of quirky things about this vineyard uh it's hard to say huh. but the the shenan that you're tasting right now is 100 percent from this vineyard that's right because you said the rothrock was was ripped out right that's right yeah which is kind of the sad thing i mean it's it is a sad thing about you know these kind of vineyards is when when they either when they go out of fashion or I don't know if there was any sort of leaf roll or like other issues in vineyards but like every once in a while you know you do have to rip up vineyards and plant new vines but I always I always get really sad when it's things like old vine Shannon that get ripped out because it is so much part of the heritage and and you know legacy of, of Washington yeah it was too bad uh I, I mean I have compassion for the owners you know like uh sure. they can't ch charge the same amount of money for Old Vine Shannon as they can for Cabernet Sauvignon or Honeycrisp apples or you yeah. know there's <laughs> yeah. yeah for sure hmm. here's this is the crew at Upland this was an all lady pick that we had nice yeah oh, so that well this is good because the next wine we're gonna taste which and by the way this Shannon Blanc is just gorgeous like it's the kind of Shannon like you know we at least learning about Shannon, you always sort of taste Bouvray and, and Sauvignon and these Loire Valley Sh Shannons first. And then um, you try, like I've tried new world versions of Shannon and I've never tried something from, from South Africa or Washington or California or anywhere that is just like as French, I guess, as this is like, wow. it, really, it really does. It has, it has the kind of fruits you want where you do get like tree fruits, like that apple pear, like in, in some stone. Um, but there is minerality here and I'm, I'm loving, I'm loving it. And it's still like super crisp, but it has, you know, it's, it's great. It's a beautiful one. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, very flattering. Well, the flattering is just beginning, Erica. Let's do the <laughs> Um, and now we're going back into vintage. So this is, uh, or wines again. So same, same label. Um, this is the 2019 Grenache. So um last year's and Grenache I mean I've, I tell people all the time Grenache is one of my favorite varieties um 
that, like, I love the ones that we work with. We work with some awesome Grenache. Um, but tell me a little bit about uh, this guy. And feel free, if you do want to share your screen and show more pictures again, I always love the pictures. But um, but Okay. Uh, what's, Maybe what's we'll the, talk about it a teensy bit first, and then I'll show yeah. you some photos. Perfect. Uh, perfect. So I guess it was the first three years I only made Shannon Blanc which is probably why your sommelier friends know me for Shannon Blanc. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's all I made. Uh, but then in 2016, I wanted to make a red wine. And again, like I'm trying to do something different than my clients, different in style, kind of different in like seriousness, for sure a different price point. Um, so this, I, I wanted something that was like medium bodied that in Seattle could be paired with grilled salmon, or, you know, like a red wine that you could have with a strongly flavored fish. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been, it's been learning by doing like I had um, the style has changed a little bit through the years, but uh, I'm happy with this 19. I, I like the fruit character. So it's, it's definitely red fruited, like, strawberry i talk about it like pomegranate red plum yeah but uh it is it's more structured so some of my first vintages were too fruity to be taken seriously a little bit hmm. um so this one has like a more structure and weight yeah but well it does but also it doesn't have enough structure or weight to not go with fish which i think is it like it's still it still strikes me as like a lifted red fruited aromatic. I like that there's a little bit of like funk on it too, like an earth, like an earthiness, which okay. you don't find in a lot of Washington wines. <laughs> like, it reminds me more of like a French style Grenache. Um, yeah, it makes me want to have it with some some grilled. We grilled salmon the other day with like a rhubarb compote. This would be perfect for that. Ooh, yum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm let me show you. I'll show you some pictures of the vineyard. Okay, so it was planted in 2004. Here is the crew harvesting. This is just a glamour shot of Grenache. The clusters can be quite big mm. and the leaf is distinctive. So for me, this, this is like a really Grenache-y photo. Mm -hmm. um, so something that I'm I'm still learning, like it ripens very differently than the Bordeaux varietals that I work on. So um, for Bayer, I get Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc from this same vineyard. And those clusters will be uniformly dark purple, black, blue color. And you can see here that there's this kind of translucent pink in some of the berries on that big cluster. Mm -hmm. And the you know they they are different ripeness. There's different acidity. There's different tannin. So trying to figure out when to harvest this block is really challenging. And I Grenache can get sugary quickly. Mm -hmm. And I am trying to make a wine that's like not too high in alcohol. Mm -hmm. So that's um, been a challenge. Have you learned like is it is it something to do with the flowering stage and like fruit set like? Or is it just like naturally, like the vine ripens unevenly and, and... My limited understanding is that it is sensitive to heat and sunlight, mm -hmm. which is kind of weird since it's grown in like the Southern Spain and Southern France and places that are quite hot and dry. Um, so like if, if we were to pick that cluster and like look at the, the face of it that is interior, Mm -hmm. um those berries would not be pink it huh. really it it is like either sun i i don't know enough if it's like sun affected yeah. or just that those berries got the most heat direct heat in the morning i yeah. don't know well it's funny because that's actually something i like the most about the way grenache tastes and this and this one too like because of those grapes that maybe are underripe in the same cluster as the overripe grapes you get this mix of those flavors in the wine. So you do get, you know, maybe a riper plum or strawberry or, or something in the wine, but you also get the pomegranate or the cranberry or something that suggests something a little brighter and a little more acidic. 
And I like I think that balances out Grenache, and that's why I love Grenache so much too. Is that it has kind of this wide range of of fruit flavors, as well as all the other you know other flavors and tertiary aromas. Yeah, that's exactly right. It can really stylistically it can go in a lot of different directions. So I'm trying to make mine on more of the lighter bodied style. Mm -hmm. This is oh so this so is can, crazy yeah yeah. <laughs> So we, for the first two years, we destemmed Syrah with scissors and co-fermented this Syrah with my Grenache, um, which is a technique that I had read about. And now that I have my own brand, I'm able to do these kind of crazy things for myself. So uh, it's like, why scissors? So here's the question. When you have a cluster and you're, you're cutting off berries by scissors, why that versus just ripping off berries and, and throwing them in the bin? Right. So you can see, I think in this photo, like there's a little like nubbin of stem that mm -hmm. is still attached to each grape. Mm -hmm. So I, I, if, you, if you pluck the grape from the stem, there is an open juncture where like, microbes could come in. Yeah, totally, yeah. So, which isn't a bad thing. It was just different than my experiment that I wanted to do. So mm -hmm. I, it, this is more like a whole cluster carbonic mm -hmm. fermentation, um, but I didn't want all of that stem in there. Right. Okay, so I wanna have the berry intact right. for this carbonic maceration, which is a grape mediated breakdown of glucose mm -hmm. into some CO2 and some other aromatics that we don't get when Saccharomyces is converting glucose into ethanol. Right. Um, so I was I wanted the little berry to stay intact. And so that's why we had to cut it with these tiny scissors. That's so cool. I think that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I we we moved away from this technique. So it was quite time consuming and at the end of the day, I didn't love the results. It oh. was so, it, it was too fruity. Too fruity. Well, yeah, because yeah. carbonic can give you just a really fruity esters and all those aromas, yeah. This is a picture of my friend, Lynn Scott from Sparkman, taking the hoops off of a barrel so that uh, I could ferment more bed inside of it. So this is a mix of whole cluster and de-stemmed fruit. Then I put dry ice because I think dry ice is fun. <laughs> so fun. It's like when you get to be a potion master in the winery. I love it. And then this was after whatever, two weeks. Um, so it's now wine. And this is are you, my. Are you doing native yeast fermentation is on your wines? It depends. So yeah. the Shannon, yes. And mm. my Chardonnay, yes. This wine, the Morved is yes. The Grenache, I, I do inoculate. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not there yet. I'm mm -hmm. a little bit too, I like, I, I'm too afraid of the microbiology to um, let it go wild. Right, right. Yeah. All right. So okay. that's, yeah. Well, we have one more wine to try. And then I want to talk a little bit about your lab and then have some time for questions too. So we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll go quick through this last one. So this is, um, back to Bear. So this is the other winery that you're you're the consulting winemaker uh, for. Um, this is a 2017, so we get to go back even a little further vintage-wise. And this is uh, Merlot. Is this 100% um, Merlot, or are you are you blending in a little bit of other Bordeaux varieties uh, with it? You know, I did not bring the tech sheet for this. Oh. I want to okay. say. This is not 100%. There are vintages that have been 100, but this is, I think there is some Cabernet Franc. Gotcha, yeah. I yeah. want to say it's like 87 Merlot, 13 Franc. Okay, so a little bit of Franc. So kind of like a yeah. right bank blends kind of uh, thing. Cool. This is my first time trying this, so I'm, I'm super. Oh, yeah? Okay. Oh, wow. I also love, so 2017, I think we've talked about this um, before in Washington was, was sort of the year that it ended up being kind of cooler than 16 or 18. And then like part of it was due to, you know, 
wildfire smoke and haze that blocked out the sun for certain parts of the ripening season. And, um, but, but for me, I love the cooler vintages, especially for red wines, because you get so much structure and tension. And this is like, this is the kind of Merlot I like drinking. Merlot, I like when Merlot isn't your chocolate covered cherry, you know, really plummy, ripe, plump kind of Merlot. I like Merlot that has a little bit of edge to it. And this is totally that. Like this, to me, this is more of your red fruited with maybe a shade of black fruit. Um, but there's also a really nice herbal, like a sweet herb kind of thing to it. And maybe, I don't know if that's Cab Franc influenced also, but, um, but oh, this is, this is tasty. Thank you. I think those descriptors are right on. So I'm, I'm not afraid of a herbal component. Mm -hmm. I like, I feel like that adds to the savoriness. And when we talk about food pairing, um, I like that it has some culinary herb character and that it's not just like fruit punch, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I can show you some pictures of this vineyard. Yeah, please. But this is Stillwater Creek. Yeah. That's right. Am I doing this? Here we go. So this is um, cool because you can see that he's not using Roundup. So we've got <laughs> weeds and cover crop like flush as a carpet, you know, uh, throughout the vineyard. So this is this is Merlot from Stillwater. Mm. Obviously, this is later in the season. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just... When it when it gets a little dry and we haven't had rain <laughs> in months. <laughs> yeah. But you can see, like, it's on a slope. So um, this is pretty high elevation. It's sixteen hundred feet at the at the top of the Merlot planting, and so it's got great air drainage and super poor soils. Um, I think it's really a nice site for Merlot. Yeah, those are some kind of older vines too. Well, how old are these vines? Yeah, so they were planted in 2000. So they're really in their like sweet spot yeah, right now. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So this is my, my crew. So the, guy, the older guy in the light blue shirt is the vineyard manager, Ed Kelly. Hmm. And the guy in the green shirt is his assistant named Dennis, and then there's me, and Matt McLaughlin, who's at Bear, and Kellen, who's our um, wine club manager, sales manager at Bear. Awesome. And then this is our crew during harvest. You can see it's 2020 and we're all wearing masks. Yep. <laughs> this is my assistant, Kenny, is in the bottom right corner. Uh, so he was my assistant in the lab. But cool. that's Matt Les Bear with the ETS cap on, oh, and uh, Rachel with the sunglasses. Nice. Oh yeah, I know Rachel. Awesome. So, oh, this is just a shot of how we process outside. This is uh, the destemming operation. So you can see whole clusters were picked in the vineyard and are going through this destemming machine, mm -hmm. separating the grapes from the stems. I have a little shot of what it looks like before oh, and after. Great. Yeah, that's great. Huh. I think this is Cabernet Franc. So I'm getting off topic a little bit. Well, there's but. a little Cab Franc in here. That works. That totally yeah. works. And this is, so next to me is Lisa Bear, the owner of Bear Winery. Love it. All right. Oh, this is great. So you, you mentioned your assistant in the lab because I definitely want to start talking about your um, <clears throat> your lab because so one thing that all winemakers um, need is access to testing to ways to test your your juice but also your wine your your wine and barrel your bottled wine every anything at different times during the process to know anything from <clears throat> pH and acid levels to to I don't know sugar levels to um, VA to solve any sort of <clears throat> volume measurements and, and all the kind of things you'd have to worry about in wines or smoke. Like we were talking the other day, Eric and I were about smoking right. and how busy that's been recently, but, um, but you definitely need, and she had mentioned this earlier about needing a quick turnaround time. And so you had set up uh, your lab when, and that was relatively recent. When did, when did actually your, the actual ore lab, like this part of your business get set up? Mm -hmm. Um, and I was hoping you could also show us a little, some pictures. Uh, Erica was 
uh, nice enough to show me around the lab a couple of hours ago. So I finally got to see some of the things she does and it's very exciting. Um, but yeah, what's, how did this lab get started? Uh, and when, when were you starting to do more of that here in Woodenville? So the lab was, I was doing the lab work from the beginning. Hang on, I lost your, I lost you. Here we go. Um, yeah, so I've been, I've been doing analysis since 2006. That was the, the mainstay of my business. And then I moved to the spot that you saw today in 2013. Oh, okay. So my lab used to be inside Mark Ryan Winery, and then I moved it into there. Okay, so it's always been there in some form, uh, but now since 2013. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I thought I'd just sort of walk you through what it's like uh, during harvest. Um, so here you can see there's a Ziploc bag that has grapes inside of it. So this is uh, a client was out in the vineyard and he pulled a random sample of berries from the top and the bottom and the sides and interior and exterior part of the cluster um, to determine when he's gonna pick this block. So he gives that Ziploc bag to me, I smash it inside of that bag, and then I pour the juice into these beakers that I have labeled. And then I'm spinning the juice down in my clinical centrifuge just to get any like grape particular little pieces of skin and little solids, um, which can interfere with my analysis to get those out of the equation. Do you guys call them MOG in the lab too? Or... Uh, Not really. It's I always kind of know. like material other than grapes is MOG, M-O-G. And the people who throw that term around, I'm like, I've never heard people use that in real life. <laughs> I don't know if that exists, but. I, I, I think of that, that more like uh, at the destemmer you know, uh, like more, like, I don't know. In the lab, I wouldn't really call it MOG. It is MOG. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so here, this is just a example of all the different juices that I would be analyzing for a client who's trying to figure out when he's going to pick. Hmm. So for this, at this stage, I'm analyzing the bricks, the pH, and the titratable acidity. So this I'm, I'm showing because this is what it looks like in my lab today. Uh, so you can see these two vials with this black liquid inside. So that's wine in barrel now that one of my clients wanted to confirm that it had completed malolactic fermentation. Mm -hmm. So he brought samples to me to measure the malic acid. And it had in fact all been depleted and fully converted into lactic. So he was done with malolactic fermentation. In the background of this shot, you can see the pipette men that I've been using to hand pipette small volumes of chemicals and wine. Mm -hmm. This is, I have a new piece of equipment that's replacing- You don't have to do that as much anymore. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so here, this is a SO2 apparatus. So in fact, this time of year kind of, most of what I'm doing is checking the sulfur dioxide concentration. So this is used um, as an antimicrobial and an antioxidant. And it's something that we're monitoring as the wines age. And we care a lot about the SO2 concentration just prior to bottling, because that's our last time that we can adjust. Mm -hmm. well. Here's an example of some other ways I'm measuring volume. <laughs> <laughs> it's my pH meter. So this is, we care about the acidity a lot. Mm -hmm. This is a machine that only measures one thing, which is the ethanol concentration. I would hope and so because it's called alkalizer, which is a big yeah. <laughs> name for a science instrument. Yeah. So this was a, this was an investment that I made I guess in 2013. So at that time, it was a big deal for me to buy this. Um, so it uses near infrared. Um, it's looking at the wavelength uh, at that near infrared wow. part of the spectrum. And it can correlate that to the ethanol concentration. You can tell I don't really know exactly what is happening inside of the box, but I 
standardize it and calibrate it all the time. So I'm able to trust the results. Yeah. And you probably know more about that than any of us do. So that's, so that's no cool. way. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, so this is uh, the spectrophotometer that I have been using um, to measure a lot of different analytes, the sugar, the malic acid, and the nitrogen concentration, um, which is something that often we have to supplement during fermentation. Mm -hmm. So here you can see this is my assistant, Kenny, uh, just being a machine. So this mm -hmm. was a day, a big day in the lab. We had a lot of juice panels to run. And he's got some positional cues where he knows which ones he's measured and which one he hasn't. And this one needs that reagent. He's very skilled. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was showing Eli today, I uh, purchased some new equipment and before I can analyze the wine on that special equipment, I need to clarify it more than what my clinical centrifuge could be capable of. So I got this micro centrifuge, which um, spins faster and harder. So that, um, any grapes, Great particulate matter for sure is pelletized, but also um, yeast and bacteria would, through centrifugal force, be separated from the clear wine. Wow! Wow! So then, this is my it's new robot. Yeah, my new robot. This is called a <laughs> Y15, and it hopefully it's new to me i've only had it for two weeks but uh it's hopefully going to be a real time saver for me uh running multiple analyses simultaneously mm -hmm. so um in the center tray there um are little tiny vials that have wine inside of them and so it's really trying to alleviate operator error or there's really it's impossible to get these samples switched around if they are fixed in this tray you know mm -hmm. yeah and then here you can see my finger is pointing at this very fine needle and so this is it's doing all of the pipetting by this robot so that robotic arm is traveling back and forth um, between the different reagents, which are in that tray to the left, to the samples in the middle. And then on the far right for me, I hope it is not mirror for you guys. Um, there is a rotor, which um, contains these little cells where the reactions are taking place. So um, hmm. it's pretty cool. I'm excited about it. And I'm learning more about the capabilities of this new machine oh i love it it's it's crazy. i was actually wondering like it's, i love that shot too by the way i feel like, <laughs> I feel like that last shot is so you too because like you're you are such a foodie and like food and wine and like the whole idea of a meal together is so big but last question before uh laps so do you have like a running list of other gadgets or things that you want mm. to to purchase or like to add to your collection and for your lab? Or is it something where you're just like, oh, this will work for now. And then when you run into an issue or a problem, you think, oh, I need to reach out and get something new. Well, this past harvest, like we were at maximum capacity, right? Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't, there aren't any more hours in the day. Like I could not work anymore. And my assistant has a PhD. Okay. Like I'm never going to get somebody as skilled as this guy ever working for me again. Right. <laughs> so. Uh, I, you know, changes had to be made. And so I was looking into ways to automate some of the lab work and it's, it's challenging. Wine analysis is, is difficult and different from water analysis or clinical blood work. It, it has its own, um, unique interferences that can be challenging to overcome. So, um, with in my lab, I see such a wide spectrum of different, you know, I'm seeing sparkling wine, I'm seeing Riesling all the way to guys making port. So um, huh. I need equipment that is capable of analyzing all these different styles of wine. Right, right. Oh, man, well, this is so interesting. I do, 
I know that we're, we're running towards the end of our time. So I wanted to make sure that I had some time available for people to ask questions. If you do have questions of uh, Erica and like what she's doing. Um, so, I mean, cause I feel like I could ask you 10 more questions, but I would feel bad <laughs> if other people had questions that they wanted to ask you and didn't get a chance to. Um, so if there's anyone else that does have a question, feel free to unmute. You can use the chat box. Um, to, and you can ask Erica anything about the wines or about her science lab. Uh, Mary Margaret, well, yeah, what were you thinking? Well, sure. I mean, I, I'm just curious about where the technology is. Does the do does the equipment exist that can do the types of things that you're talking about? And um, and you know, and I'm sure the expense of that because I don't know what the scale is, what the market is for for these types of things. And are there areas that don't have that kind of automation yet that you would want to see kind of come online next? Hmm. Uh, so yes, the equipment exists. Uh, there are commercial labs that um, service the wine industry. Um, they, they are beyond my budget. Uh, and so some of that I, I'm a client of those labs. Um, when we are looking for specific chemicals to be analyzed, like trichloroanisole for cork taint, or like the smoke taint markers that we talked about, Eli, like uh, that requires very um, special equipment that I don't have in the lab. I, other things that could be automated, I mean, there's millions of things. Yeah, that like uh, could be better. And I guess we're trying to figure out, um, actually I had an engineer come visit last harvest who had some ideas about how to optimize uh, seller ads to barrels. A, a lot of this stuff is just like, let's say, you know, it's, it's complicated. There, there's a whole bunch of barrels, they all look the same. Are you confident that you added the SO2 solution to all 13 of these barrels? So for us in the cellar, we make these, you know, we have chalk, we made a check mark, or we somehow indicated we have taken care of that barrel. It's now done. But it's so easy to skip one or, you know, your phone rings, you get a text message, whatever. So um, yeah, automating some of that kind of thing could be a good idea. I'm surprised you you let people have their cell phones on because you were telling me that <laughs> <laughs> during well, days it's hard Yes, to <laughs> right. Well, in the lab, like I, I, I am distracted by people chatting. Like we don't talk, like during a break time, we can, okay, well, we're gonna have tea, we can talk. <laughs> but like when we're working, if I'm at the computer, if the other person, like, there, it's not a um, chatty, fun <laughs> place to work. Right, right. right but this, right. this is how I, uh, this is what I know. You know, like I'm used to working alone and working, being able to really focus. Right. Mark and Robin, you, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, so pre-harvest and harvest time are really busy. Do you have any down times during the year where you don't need to do as much lab work? For sure. And I mean, we're essentially in one of those periods now. Um, I'm hoping later this month to go to California to see my family because I haven't seen them through this whole pandemic. Um, and it should be, it, it's in between the bottling dates of my clients and the other random customers that I have that may need lab work. I actually, I've got Kenny, my old assistant coming back to help me out when, um, I'll be with my family. Nice. When you said that you what apparatus would you like if you had no financial limits? <laughs> well, the so like uh, the way that you can measure these specific compounds is like a it's a GCMS, so a gas chromatograph that has a mass spectrometer on the end of it. So this can um, isolate and analyze the concentration of specific molecules. So that would be powerful. And like, I mean, hopefully we're not gonna have wildfires this year, but uh, it does seem likely in my lifetime that we may have another wildfire again and we would need 
that information about um, to what extent the grapes have been tainted by the smoke in the air. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Patty, yeah. Hello. Um, wonderful presentation. It's so intriguing. Um, simple question, though. Um, what cracker or what thing do you recommend to um, change your palate uh, or to, to uh, release um, all those tastings that you have? So I don't usually have a cracker. I, I rinse my mouth out with water and I like sparkling okay. wa water. Um, like on days when we really have like power tastings where I'm putting a hundred different red wine samples in my mouth. Um, I like San Pellegrino or- celiac, Erica? Pardon? Is, that, is part of the reason because you're celiac and you can't actually have gluten? Is that why you don't do crack crackers? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I could have a rice cracker or something, but uh, in general, I mean, in all of my tasting groups, like we never, we never have uh, crackers. And just water. I guess that's my question, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. The other if we did the in-home, just kind of sampling with friends or something, what do you serve them to just water? Okay. The other thing, Patty, that I've heard in, in less about palate, but more about nose and like resetting your senses, a lot of a lot of um, tasters who do that will smell coffee beans or espresso or like coffee flavor. Right. I've seen the, you see beans. coffee beans around sometimes. OK, right. And then even I'll even go further into the vulgar sense. A lot of people actually smell their armpit. And I'm, I'm telling you this right now, if you go to a, a tasting, Nancy's been at one, I'm sure, where you do a bunch of, like you do a hundred of wines and you're, and you're judging, a lot of people will like smell their armpit and then go back. But what it does is that you're, it resets your brain kind of, cause like your brain can get oversensitized. And it's, if you smell the same thing over and over and over again, you won't be able to smell it anymore. Or you're, you're, you sort of get used to that. And so you have to smell something completely different to go back to wine. I don't, and I don't know if that's something, Erica, you've, you've experienced too, but I've definitely had to like smell something different to get sure. back to, <laughs> into taste. Yeah, like. even like smelling your glass of water can be yeah. something. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fun. Any, were there any other questions for Erica while we still had her here? Or in, this is great. I mean, you, you just like showered us with so much information. I love it. I'm so <laughs> happy that we'll be able to have this and have the video for people to see. Um, cool. Yeah, I just want to like, thank you so much for doing this. I, I will say, you know, um, I talked to Chris earlier today, too. And he's and I was like, Oh, yeah, I'm interviewing Erica. And he was like, Oh, man, Erica is so great. And the one thing he did say, oh. like, he's like, honestly, and the fact that you do have your lab here in Woodenville, like you said earlier, it's such a big deal to be able to turn around lab results and have that instant access to, to information for winemakers who are making really quick decisions on things. Uh, it's so crucial. And he said, he's like, I honestly think that Erica is the reason why, like, the bar has been raised in Woodenville wine. That there's a lot of wow. wine, there's a lot of people that have, have used Erica for uh, lab analysis and consulting, and it really has like raised the bar. And that wines wineries now are making some great wines, and a lot of it is because of what you're doing. So um, I know we are always very thankful for the help you give us, but also just for what you're doing for the industry in general. So. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, it's so, so nice to hear. Thank you. I'll <laughs> receive those compliments. Thank you. And it's thing, been an yeah. honor to be a part of this. Thank you for this asking. This has been so fun. And the last thing I will say is, or and ask you is, how can people reach, like get a hold of you? How can they uh, purchase your wines? I know you have, you have a great website. I will say, if you're interested in blogs, her blog is pretty awesome. And there's a lot of really cool food stuff on her blog, like making, like, uh, vinegar from leftover red wine from <laughs> or like making uh, aperitifs from your leftover white like you're, you're really cool stuff on there so you should definitely do that but how can people like find out more about your wines and more about you thank you uh, they can google Erica or wine and I should come up uh, my website's Erica or wines.com the lab is or wine lab.com if you're interested in the analytical stuff and uh, locally, my wines are at PCC and Whole Foods and some of the independent uh, wine shops like McCarthy and Shearing and Pike and Western. Awesome. And you are doing some direct shipping or like you can order online from your website and do some direct shipping? Exactly. Yes. Awesome. 
Awesome. Well, and I'll include, I always follow up and do a blog post with like a fact check sheet, which we don't have to check any facts, but when we do interviews, it's nice because I get to include um, links to things. So I'll make sure that I link her website and things on our blog post as well. Um, but yeah, but Erica, thank you so much. This has been so fun. I'm so glad you joined us today. Uh, and for everyone else, I'll see you next week. Next week is another interview. Uh, we're actually going to be talking to Lacey Liebeck from Sagemore Farm. So we'll get more of the, the viticultural side and talk more about vineyards and see some pictures of, of where the vineyards are uh, right now in May. Um, but I hope to see a lot of you then. Uh, other than that, take care. I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful week. And if you wanted to unmute and say goodbye, I always love hearing your voices. Um, <laughs> say goodbye, and then we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone.